You are the only person who can decide what impossible is. Oh, that is. And um, and I say that as somebody who's been told so many times that things are impossible. Welcome to this episode of Finding Your Range podcast with me, Jeannie Debon, a movement therapist who specializes in hypermobility, EDS, and chronic pain. And today I'm delighted we're going to have two guests joining us today. This is a first for us on the podcast. Um, so at the moment we're joined by um, Yasmin, um, and I'm going to read you her bio. And I'm super excited about this podcast, um, so I hope you're going to love it too. And then hopefully we're going to have another lady um, joining us very soon, um, and I will introduce her as well. So let's introduce Yasmin. So Yasmin is 26 years old, and she lives in London. She is currently a trainee educational and child psychologist, which is involving completing a three-year doctorate. Yasmin was diagnosed with hypermobile EDS last year, after she experienced rapid deterioration of her health, most likely due to the coronavirus lockdown. In her spare time during the last six years, Yasmin has become an avid rock climber. And she really feels like this held her together, literally, in terms of her joints and EDS, but also mentally. Yasmin began to notice that as a plus size paraclimber, she was somewhat of an anomaly at climbing centers and in outdoor spaces. She is therefore particularly passionate about promoting diversity and inclusion in the climbing and outdoor industries and does this in her roles on the teams of All In Beta and United We Climb, two organizations dedicated to the aforementioned cause. Amazing, welcome. Really lovely oh. to have you here. Um, now, our other guests have just arrived, so I'm just going to let them in as well. And uh, we will introduce her, which is, here she is. And then we'll get started with these two amazing ladies, inspiring people joining us. Hello. There we go. So, um, Anusha, just so you know, we are, we've started recording. Okay. So you're thrown right in at the deep end here. No preparation, no, no warning, we're off. That's fine. Um, so um, I've just introduced Yasmin. So well, thank you and welcome to joining us as well. And I'm just gonna read your bio out um, to everyone who's listening and then we'll get started. So um, let's meet Anusha. So she is 33. She's, um, oh, I, this is a big word. How am I gonna say British and Luxembourgish? Is that right? Not bad. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever said that word. Okay. And currently living and working in London as a civil servant, having grown up in Luxembourg and studied in different countries. Anusha was diagnosed with hypermobile EDS four years ago after experiencing different symptoms throughout her life. She was also born missing her right arm below the elbow and is a cancer survivor. She was a competitive swimmer and martial artist until the age of 15 when her joints became too loose. She was advised to stop and that led to a 10 year deconditioning with nine surgeries and culminating with cancer. Anusha started climbing to recondition her body after cancer treatment, but only took it up as a regular hobby five years ago and has been competing nationally since then. Climbing isn't just a mental escape from her hectic and over-medicalized life, but the movement patterns helped put her joints back in place and, th and strengthened her so much, um, she has a much better quality of life. And she also met her husband while competing, which is lovely. Um, being visibly disabled and having invisible health conditions, as well as having Pakistani heritage and wearing a headscarf, Anusha has experienced plenty of barriers in life be they self-limiting beliefs, the perception of others, and how society is designed in an inequitable way. Anusha is passionate about reducing all these barriers, in particular access to sport and calling things out as they are. She's an ambassador for Limb Power, EDS UK, patron for Grit and Rock, co-founder of Power Climbing London, and is also a team member of United We Climb. 
Anusha is currently recovering from major abdominal surgery and is struggling to walk after a very difficult and medically complicated 2020. Wow. Thank you so much. Welcome. Welcome, both of you. You've both got such amazing um, backgrounds and stories to share. So um, I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. So as I say, this is the first time we've had two guests. So um, this is going to be this is going to be a bit of an experiment as well. So how, how we manage to um, hear from you both. But um, so let's hit, let's start right at the beginning. So Yasmin, why don't we start with you? Um, we mentioned that you only got your diagnosis last year. Um, what was life like growing up? What was, you know, how did you know that maybe something wasn't quite right? So I've always had ongoing health issues and I've always known I was hypermobile. I didn't realise it could be the root cause of, of all my issues. Um, I had a really nasty bout of glandular fever when I was about 18. Um, and since then, I sort of never quite recovered. I've, I've had chronic fatigue. Um, but it wasn't actually until COVID-19 and the lockdown that I realised the impact of everything um, and how much I'd actually become very conditioned by climbing for six years, which was holding my entire body together. So when that stopped, all of a sudden, everything fell apart. Um, and it was only from meeting other paraclimbers um, that I really understood what, what EDS was and realised that it could be a possibility for myself. And it, it was. Yeah. And, and how did that feel when you got that diagnosis? Was it a relief or were you worried about it? Um, for me, it was it felt like a unifying diagnosis. It felt like it tied together a lot of the things that I've experienced. And actually, there are still days where I say to people like Anouche, like, oh, I know why I get nosebleeds. It's because I have EDS or, oh yeah, that explains why this happens to me. And we still have conversations like that. So it's still, you know, there are still things that flick in, into place yeah. for me um, yeah. that I never really realised were part of it. So yeah, for me, it's been um, a relief that I have that unifying diagnosis. I am worried about what it will be like uh, going back to climbing. Now I've experienced sort of lots of um, joint subluxing and, and all that kind of, um, thing and I'm worried about some things about what my future will look like but overall um, I do believe that knowledge is power and since my diagnosis I've been able to really um, you know soak up the knowledge about it and inform myself of how best to go about things. Yeah, absolutely. 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 When people understand what's going on it takes away that fear factor as well, well doesn't it? Yeah. 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 And, and, and I was about you, Anusha, how, how was life growing up for you? And you obviously had other issues as well when you were growing up. It's really weird. Um, I wasn't actually seen as hypermobile until I was about 15. Um, I was just, um, my little arm was my little arm. I had some balance issues, interestingly enough, as a child. And I needed physio and OT. Um, Sort of when I was two and three, I was getting specialist help already back then. But everybody attributed that to my arm, not yeah. to the fact that I might have underlying UDS already. I had gastro issues all through my childhood, um, since I was born, actually. And again, nobody really pinpointed. I had lots of things which probably, had somebody looked at it holistically, would have probably gone EDS. Um, mm -hmm. So the very typical things which I now see as, you know, falling over and, 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 you know, to my knees, tripping over things, walking into things, um, being known as a clumsy person. Um, it was very typical, but it wasn't until I was about 15 when, when my right shoulder started subluxing when I slept um, and sneezed and, and whatever, it was really loose by then. But again, because my right shoulder's malformed as well, everybody allocated that to the malformation of my shoulder, not EDS. Yeah. And when they told me to stop martial arts and I started deconditioning, that's when we started wondering what was going on because something more systemic started happening. But then, and that's when sort of the surgeries, I had two surgeries on my thumb, I had to fuse one of my bones. I, had, I suddenly developed herniated discs in my back for no reason after pulling, opening a car door after an 80 kilometer hike. So people were thinking, okay, this is, this is abnormal. And then 
and but then cancer happens and so again it was sort of like a load of the fatigue and the deconditioning symptoms not allocated to the fact that I'd had chemo and radiotherapy and, and a lot of treatment frankly and that I'd been really unwell it was only when I finally moved to London um, for work back in 2013 that I saw my prostheticists um, at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital who deal with EDS and they went we're referring you straight to the hypermobility physios. Um, and they were straight off, we can't officially tell you you have EDS and we're not going to officially tell you until you get the diagnosis. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're also not officially going to tell you you have orthostatic intolerance as well. So I found that out on the day I saw my specialist um, as well. She just went, I walked into the room and, and they just went, you walk like a person with EDS. And I went, okay. Oh, oh wow. Yes. Amazing. It's really interesting that both of you at different times of your life, the not being active is the thing that really starts to cause the issues for you. And, you know, um, you know we know that you know, exercise movement is so important to us, but you guys you really highlight how that can be quite a dramatic drop in how you feel. Um, it's very interesting. And so you both have seen uh, found climbing which you both are very passionate about. Um, so how did that happen? How did you get into it? How did that all start? Um, so uh, Anusha, do you want to start, start us off with that one? Yeah, so basically I tried it as an eight-year-old on a school trip. My friends got up the full wall. I got up half and didn't think much of it. But the next day or the next time you did that school trip, I was determined to get up to the top because all my friends are doing it. Yes. And... Um, got up to the top and I clearly liked the adrenaline of touching the top pole and came up to my parents and said, I want to climb as a hobby. And they went, one, too dangerous, two, no. And three, you're in martial arts anyway, so no. Uh, and that was it. I didn't really do it again. Um, I, I wanted to, I kept sort of, you know, probing whether I could or not, but it wasn't really something that was um, uh, sort of encouraged at all. So I didn't really go for it until... Um, post cancer one of the problems I was having is I have lymphedema in my left arm um, and some scar tissue down my rib cage which means um, I was really struggling with my left arm independence things like washing my hair socks mm. there are, and there is no right arm so there was sort of like we were going to have to my friends were preparing for an intervention and one of my best friends who did the same school trip as me um, and took up climbing um, basically persuaded me to come with her and I was really scared because I was like well you know, it's one thing to try it as an eight-year-old when you're healthy-ish. It's another thing to try it as a post-cancer, barely walking 23-year-old who can't do a flight of stairs without being out of breath um, and whose arm isn't really working right. Um, and she said, basically, she challenged me and said I was scared. And and I went, well, yes, I'm scared of all sorts of things, including, you know, what I'll look like in a harness because it's going to squeeze the bits I'm not really confident about. Um, falling, even though everybody in climbing falls, but Back then, I thought falling was silly. Um, yeah. And yeah, she, she just went, basically, she just, she, you know, she just went, what have you got to lose? Worst thing, you don't like it. And it's fine because you've tried tons of other sports. And that's another one you'll add to your last best thing. It's going to change your life. And it did. Um, I cried. It was awful, painful. Um, but the mental escape of the focus you need on the wall to even just coordinate your body, even if it's minor movements, because I was so deconditioned, minor movements is all I could really do at the time. Um, that sort of focus made me forget that I was ill. It made me feel normal for the first time in a very, very long time, actually. And it was a bit of a breath of fresh air after having been quite underwater in quite a dark space for quite a while. Um, that It was that mental feeling that actually made me come back. It wasn't the... And the physical movement, actually, it was the first time I'd seen a sport not misalign anything. It was the first time my pain levels had also gone down. Um, so I'd, I was curious and experimental and sort of went, what if I go back and what if I, again, see a reduction in pain levels? And actually, no, climbing isn't, I go to climbing even when I'm unwell because actually it reduces my pain levels. It realigns my joints, even if we know I'm not fit, climb, yeah. still go for a gentle movement session because ultimately that is the best place for me to realign things. Wow, so, so basically the, the client, so the realignment of your body when you're climbing reduces your pain. So it shows how important realignment is then. There's lots of ways of doing that, but that's 
So similar to Anouche, I've, I mean, I've always loved the outdoors and sort of adventure activities. And my parents really joke because they're so not into those kind of things. We never went on like adventure holidays or or anything like that. We're very much sit on the beach and do nothing. Um, <laughs> they find it really um, odd that I've always been into adventure. So, um, yeah, similar to Anouche, I sort of experienced it through the girl guides. I, I did sort of loads of girl guides activities. Yeah, similar school trips and always loved the climbing elements of it um but there was a part of me that uh, I had this narrative that I shouldn't be doing sports and I wasn't good at sports because I had some really bad experiences with sports teachers at school um mm -hmm. who would single me out for not you know running the same way or the same speed as as my classmates or just really made me feel like I didn't belong in sport which actually looking back was very much the wrong way to go about getting someone who really needed to exercise to exercise so I had this yeah I had this narrative no Yasmin doesn't do sport um that's that was what went on in my head mm -hmm. um but I did in the back of my head also go oh but I really enjoy the sort of the, the adventure sports that kind of thing anyway Fast forward to when I was about 17 and my boyfriend at the time, who is now one of my best friends, so he doesn't mind me talking about this. He um, was into rock climbing and had been since he was a child. And while we were dating, he sort of invited me along. Um, but I really just felt too self-conscious. I thought people will laugh at me. Um, I'll be different to everyone there. Um, and I sort of didn't really want to make a fool of myself in front of him. He was my boyfriend, uh, my first sort of proper long-term boyfriend. Um, and then when we stopped dating, <laughs> I said to him, hey, will you take me climbing now? And he went, what? <laughs> um, so he did. And he taught me the ropes and I just loved it. I didn't realise that um, when you go to a climbing wall, firstly, no one really is judging you at uh, what grade you're climbing. Their climbing centres have um grade the the climbs are graded yes they have sort of the lowest um of low that was, is almost sort of almost easier than the ladder and they have really high sort of tiny little things that you can barely grip onto and there really is something for everyone and I got cheered when I got to the top and I just felt you know what people are going to support me doing this um I'd completely switched off at, at the time my my mood was really low I was I was quite depressed actually um, and I realized I'd felt a sense of achievement I'd felt um, good about myself um, which is completely what the opposite of what I expected um, and yeah I, as as Anoushe said I, I'd completely been able to escape from yeah. reality and really focus on even the smallest of movements and yeah, it became almost from there like an addiction because it feels so good that you just um, want to keep going. Gosh, that's amazing. And, and you, you both kind of touched on um, you know, one of my questions I was going to ask you is, you know, what does it represent and how does it make you feel? But you've kind of, you know, you've just touched on that a little bit. It makes you feel pretty awesome by the sounds of it. Yeah. And I think I wrote, you know, I wrote down some words that climbing makes me feel and I, I, I think for me it represents growth um that's personal growth physical growth um and stepping out of my comfort zone that kind of that kind of growth that I never thought I'd do it's really self-empowering it represents determination um you know I I've never had to be um so determined to do I mean for me things like um studying has always come quite naturally and as I said physical activity hasn't so I've really had to push at it to keep myself going mm. and I'm proud of that Absolutely. I'm proud and yeah it, it just feels like empowering it's really yes. empowering the mental strength is is just amazing is it when you're living with a chronic illness as well having that mental strength it's so important um and Anusha what about you how does it make you feel what does it represent to you now um climbing represents a lot of things it represents safety for me safety and the knowledge that I can feel better when I go. It represents peace uh, from my complicated life. It represents home. Um, so much of my life is now reflected through climbing, including finding my husband. It literally is home for me to a certain extent. Um, we have a climbing wall at home um, as well. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, how, that's how home it, it feels. Um, but it's the same as Yasmin. It's, it's empowering. It's 
it's empowering because you get to choose what your challenge is on that given day. You get to choose what you feel up to. You get to choose whether you want to be proud of managing a whole route or managing a single move, whether that move is simple or that move is complicated. It's all up to you. You choose what your boundary is. And in that sense, it's also empowering because it teaches you about boundaries. Right. Um, and it teaches you how to put them up outside of your climbing life as well, oh. gradually. Um, and I think it's, it's a teacher. Uh, signals of your body when you're tired teaches you how not to you know um can't remember the word now brain fog um you know spoon theory the whole boom and bust thing yes. it teaches yes. you how to avoid that because if you boom and bust on the wall you're you're pretty much useless so you start learning how to pace yourself quite actively because you're having to physic climbing is quite a um a demanding sport it can be but it can also be a gentle sport um, I dislocated my knee last summer, um, last April, and I'm still sort of, I've got torn ligaments and need assistance on the wall. My, my coach was actually hauling me up with a rope to relieve the amount of energy I needed to put in, which meant I could pace myself better because that's how much assistance I needed. But we've gone from me being completely dynamic and, and really strength driven to at the moment me being sort of very gentle movements and controlled movements and sort of very mindful exercise. So there'll be people listening thinking, oh my gosh, did she just say she had like torn ligaments in her knee and she still went and did her climbing? Absolutely. So most people will be like, I'm not going to do anything. I'm just going to rest. I'm not going to. So that's, that's amazing. Most people would go, no, thanks. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing anything. How, how did you, why did you want to, I mean, I think it's, you know, fantastic, but why did you want to go and climb? What, what got you there when you, you know, that's a, men a huge mental power, isn't it? Um, there was a point when I got told I was hypermobile and I had to cold turkey stop martial arts. I got taught, as it is, like Yasmin, I had problems when I was doing PE classes in school because I was the different one. And yeah. I was the obviously different one. Um, but like, it was well as that, like, so martial arts for me was my escape from sort of bad gym classes. But then yes. when I had to stop martial arts, I it was ingrained into me that sports was a bad thing for my joints medically. I was told that by my doctors. I was told that sports would pop my joints out. So I became scared of my body and became scared of sports. Wow. When I did my knee in last year and then found out I was going to need abdominal surgery, which finally happened in January, I felt that feeling come on again of sports and activity because the problem is I also had a blood clot in my other leg. Um, so at that point, activity genuinely became gen um, dangerous at one point, especially while the blood clot was was sort of melting in my in my vein. Um, so I mean, I had to become scared of sport, and I absolutely hated that feeling of being scared of moving again because yes. of what would happen. So as soon as it was deemed safe enough for me to even try the lightest of lightest of climbs, even just touching the hold, getting myself familiar with being safe again in that space. I did that and I'm doing the same again right now with the whole surgery seven weeks ago. Last week I got my first on the floor, touching the holes, just getting myself familiar again with the space. Awesome, well done. And um, I mean, you both mentioned um, this, but um, you know, th this idea, you, you talked about your schooling and how difficult it was and how, you know, that you felt, you know, bad about doing PE and people made you feel bad and so so much of this is coming down to our belief systems right so I mean Yasmin you obviously you had a belief system that you know you weren't good at sport and things like that but you know how how has that impact obviously it's had a big impact hasn't it that the conditioning that we have as a child as a child both of you I mean um Lucia, you were scared of of moving scared of you know sport and what do you think about your sort of that, that conditioning and the belief systems, Yasmin? Yeah, I mean, as a psychologist, this is something I'm really interested in anyway, um, in that area. I think that actually it's really affected me to this day. I still have issues with my self-confidence. I still, um, that's changed. Um, it's not the same issues before, as I said, it was that I didn't believe I should do sport. Now, sometimes... I wonder, am I still a valid climber if I'm not climbing X, Y, Z grades after being climbing for six years? Am I still valid as someone who suffers daily with a chronic illness if I go out and climb? You know, I still have these 
things that go round in my head um, that make me question. And I think that is really rooted um, in the questioning I was made to do as, of everything as a child. Yeah, sure. So um, a big fatigue is is my biggest one. And actually, it's like what um, Anoushe was saying. I am guilty of those boom and bust cycles. Um, so a big obstacle for me is sort of knowing how hard to push myself on a given day um, so before I get to a point where it will be debilitating the next day. Um, so sometimes that's just going to the wall and socialising um, or sometimes it's just, go, you know, getting on one climb and going, actually, today's not the day. Or sometimes it's going, today, I'm just going to do loads and loads of easy ones and I'll go for volume over difficulty. Or some days it's, oh, I don't have that much energy, but I could probably have a really good go at this one hard climb. And it, for me, um, yeah, overcoming that, um, knowing myself, like knowing my barriers, knowing my body, that's that's been a big one, definitely, as as well as that lack of self confidence. That's that's my other barrier, I'd say. Yeah. Yeah. Do something. I'm just trying to get the mental side of it. And the next day, you're like, oh gosh, I'm in pain. I'm going too much. How do you feel then? Because a lot of people feel really bad about themselves. I can't do it at all. This is like for me, I hurt myself, I'm in pain, I'm not going to do anything else. How do you work on that? I think that at the beginning, I had times where I did want to just throw down my tools and stop. Yeah. Um, because I was in pain or because I wasn't, you know, doing as well as I thought I should be doing. Um, but over time it almost became a cost benefit analysis whereby there were more times I came away feeling better than there were co coming away feeling bad and being able to hold that in mind and yes. actually even if I come away in pain I, I think you know 99% of the time I come away feeling mentally better even if I come away in pain yeah. even if I physically and most of the time I you know when I'm at my sort of pre-lockdown stage I don't come away in pain I do if I you know twinge something specific yeah. um but even if I am in pain I come away feeling like you know I've been with my friends I've been in like a new say the place yeah. where I call home the place where I belong the place you know where people are on my side they're cheering yes. me on you know yeah. and there's all those emotions actually of that social connection have been found to reduce the impact of pain and how we perceive it. So remember, the pain is very much concept, is concept driven. You know, what, what setting am I in? You know, all of those things are going into those, that perception of pain. Um, and of course, pain doesn't always mean that we've done any harm. It's, you know, it's, it doesn't mean that at all. Um, so Anusha, what about for you? What sort of obstacles? Obviously, we talked again about those, but what about your obstacles and how do you overcome them? Um, a lot of my obstacles are rooted in self-limiting beliefs, and that's yeah. because of what people have told me. There's not self-limiting beliefs because of what I necessarily believe, but it's because of what I've been told. Yeah. In martial arts, I had a coach who refused to talk to me or teach to me because I had one and a half arms. And I went through that for two years because I didn't want to quit martial arts and I knew my parents would pull me out of it. So I just stayed mum because I loved the sport too much. Wow. Um, in PE, I had a teacher who, who, who didn't also refuse to teach me for four years. And I was constantly bottom of the class, even if I'd outperformed other, other students. Um, to the point where we actually had to like bring the parents and bring the headmaster into the conversation because actually it was discrimination. But 
you know what, as a 16 year old, as a 15 year old, that's a hard word to use um, as somebody who is young. So that's definitely been obstacles and, and have effectively, like Yasmin, questioned my validity um, in, in being a climber who is chronically or currently a wheelchair user struggling to walk and yet I can still call myself a climber. Does that kind of fit? <laughs> Not in the systems that we have today, but I've created my own system. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's what it is. Um, you know, and, and yeah, like Yaz, you know, if you have a day where, where you've gone in and, and, and climbed maybe something you shouldn't have or whatever else and come out the next day. So for me, I see pain as two different things. It's good pain and there's bad pain. It's the good pain of having exerted yourself and used your muscles and, and it's perfectly fine. And then there's the pain of, no, something's actually gone wrong. Either you've misaligned something yeah. or yeah. as you've pushed maybe a bit too hard. So the good pain, I don't really care about. That means I've just exercised. Um, and I now rarely get delayed onset muscle soreness anyway, unless it's a muscle I haven't engaged in that way in a while. So that's kind of for me going, oh, should have used that muscle more. Um, but then there is the days where, um, you know, maybe I did overdo it in some way and the next day I am suffering in a bit of a way. So one of those things is teaching me a lesson, regress the exercise the next, next time I go back. Start slower, yeah. try it. And graduate that exercise if it's easy that day because actually your body's gotten used to it then up the exercise a little bit but it's about that boom and bust about coming home and not being busted the next day and I try and live by that at the climbing wall because I have a full-time job and I do have a ton of other things I do and you know a husband now that I'm living with and and a life I want to lead so it's about sort of working that out and and like, yeah, sometimes it is just you want to go there and you want to bust out something and you're willing to take on the pain the next day because it's so worth it. Or sometimes, uh, if I, especially if I've misaligned something in my left arm, um, you, for me, because I'm a, a what we call it now a dynamic climber, I'm short, I have a small arm span. So inevitably, because I can't reach for things, I kind of have to go jump for them which means the movements can have a lot more momentum to them. I can end up hanging off something with an arm, hands, or, or off, just off the ends of my fingers. And sometimes that is actually the best movement to put something back in place. Yeah. yeah. People might not think that. It's distraction. It's distraction, <laughs> yeah, but it's the distraction it? of doing that actually move. So sometimes it's just about going there, doing that one move, and then going to have a cup of tea and sitting on the floor for the rest of the day, because actually the relief yeah. from realigning something is so much that your body's just like, I need to sit down now. So, you know, it's just, it's about being really intuitive about what's going on in your body. And I don't think I was before climbing. I used to just go, this is what the book says, or this is what the doctor says, and I've got to do it because that's what it says on black and white. Whereas now I'm like, well, this is how I feel. This is what I think will work, but I might turn up and go, no, scrapping that plan and go for something else. Yeah. Amazing. I also, when I'm in high training mode, um, which I was in last year. I was I was doing a really big climbing project before before my knee went, getting a glass of water at home. But anyway, um, one of the things I do is I actually make a bullet journal and log um, pain, fatigue, um, how much I'm peeing, all sorts of things to help me understand that maybe when I'm fatigued and not intuitively thinking at that point, I have uh, an objective way of looking at um, trends essentially and very evidence-based but that, that's partly because yeah, I compete that's a great idea yeah no no thank you for sharing that because I think that's really important for our listeners that you you both demonstrate that you know you don't have to give up doing something just you know you know pain is, is going to be part of the process a lot of the time because you are you know doing things maybe that your body's not used to or but there's no reason to give up um, so I really like that. I think that's really important. Um, now, this is a little bit of a tricky one, but I want to bring it up. Um, so, and I'm sure you've come across this before. Um, people may be watching thinking, gosh, these, you know, you're both fit. Well, you know, relatively fit. We've got injuries and things, but, you know, you can go and do this climbing. You can do, you know, um, really, you can't be that ill with your EDS. You go. You can't be that ill if you can go out and do all this climbing and there's a lot of people who would be saying they can't do that level of activity how would you respond to to comments like this that you know if you're not sitting at home and you know not doing anything then 
you know, you can't really be suffering with your EDS symptoms. Uh, Yasmin, what would you say to that? So that one's, yeah, it's a tricky one that I have come across. Um, and it can be hard to answer without getting really defensive. Um, but really, when you think about it, for me, climbing is almost the perfect cocktail of medication for EDS in yeah. a way. Yeah. Um, so the first thing I would say is that when I'm climbing, what you see is the tip of the iceberg. You see me at my happiest, um, at my most pain free. What you don't see is me lying on the floor in between climbs, you know, feeling rubbish. You don't see uh, the whole journey home, me feeling a bit sick or tired. You don't, you know, it's the tip of the, the iceberg, what you see. My poor fiancé having to do all the housework because I've yeah, sacrificed definitely. everything for my one climbing session, um, you know, of the, of the week. Um, so those are the bits you don't see. So I'd say... I have to remind myself that there, there are sacrifices that I've, I've had to make, yeah. but also, as I said, it's the perfect cocktail. So climbing is mindful. It's very, um, it can be very controlled. Um, as Anusha said, she's, she's becoming a dynamic climber and mm. she's signed herself up to teach me how to jump for things <laughs> after lockdown because I am what they call a static climber, which is the opposite. And I do things very slowly and very, one bit at a time because yeah. um uh, i have good balance i have no coordination um so i do things very very methodically um but yeah it, that that sort of like is my physio climbing yes. is one of uh, uh, probably climbing and maybe dancing are the only two sports i can think of that are completely non-repetitive every single move i do on that wall is different Yes. So it's full body and it's not like when you're doing reps in the gym and you're putting strain on the same muscles and yeah. the same points again and again. There's no reps in climbing. Yeah. Every movement is different. Um, and it's stepwise, as as we've both said before, you know, you can judge where you're at on the day and judge the sort of you could judge it by the number, the grade that's assigned to the climb or you could judge it by looking at the climb, how you feel, the angle, because you've got to remember the different angles, steep, yeah. you know. Yeah. And it's stepwise, you can work your way. So even someone who is, yeah, struggling to walk, if they can just sort of almost even just pull themselves up to touch a hold, that's one step. That's one mm -hmm. step. And, you know, next time you, you, you do another step. And yeah. I, think, I think that's what people don't realise when they see someone who is chronically ill climbing. They don't realise the kind of, a, the sacrifices that that person has to make maybe just to even get there and B, the adaptations that they've made to the way that they climb and their training um, to get them to where they are. So, yeah, that's that's kind of my non-defended yeah. response to that. No, 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 thank you. I know it's a difficult question, but I know, you know, it, it gets asked, you know, it's one thing we always hear, isn't it? Oh, you don't look sick, you know. You know, I can do my, I do my exercises every day and my Pilates and my movement therapy and I'm on all these amazing machines and, you know, but, you know, how can I do that every day? I don't, I'm supposed to be sick, but, you know, so I know it comes up. So um, Anusha, what would you say about that? Oh, yeah, it's hard not being defensive about that type of thing. I think it's about being aware that to make the choice to climb, especially in the way I with the way I choose to train it's effectively doing the same thing an elite athlete has to do I've got a sports nutritionist I've got a strength trainer I've got a climbing coach I've got a medical team supporting me to do it yes. now most of the athletes don't need that whole level of support not at the level I'm climbing at but because I'm actually so ill I, I need that support to be able to do what I do. I'm making that choice to yes. spend my time and, and frankly, my money on uh, doing something I absolutely enjoy doing and making a choice not to stay at home and, and effectively yeah. follow in, in effectively what is a mountain of diagnosis. I temporarily come home to my parents and met new doctors and um, they've literally hand in head, head in hand, that's the one head in hand, sorry. Uh, uh, you know, with seeing the list of what's happened um, yeah. at the moment, I am currently struggling to walk between parallel bars. In fact, I'm falling over in the parallel bars, yet I'm climbing, 
even yeah. now I'm doing both. It's a dichotomy. Yeah. Um, the other thing I'd say is everybody's on their own journey. Yeah. Um, that, you know, just because you can't see yourself doing it doesn't mean others can't. Yeah. And that doesn't mean you can't either, actually. I, I challenge anybody who says they can't climb because I'm the co-founder of Paraclimbing London and I have brought loads of people with EDS. Uh, there we go, she's rapping. Brilliant, yeah. I've left a voice up in London. Um, but, um, you know, I, I've had hours and hours of conversations with people with EDS who've been so nervous about trying to climb because they thought they couldn't. Yeah. Um, and it's I brought one person in particular who has gone from needing an hour-long conversation to persuade her to come and have a cup of tea with us competing a year later yeah amazing so like everybody can do it to the level they choose to and just because you see somebody who might be potentially photogenic on instagram doing their thing it doesn't mean they're actually okay and the other thing is i am incredibly functional when i'm not well like that's just something i am good at until i'm actually really to the point where i can't adapt um, I will function. Yeah, amazing. And um, just something you said, um, Anusha, just maybe a question for Yasmin, really on the psychology side of it, because you said, oh, I'm struggling to walk on the parallel bars, but I'm climbing. Is, again, it's just a thought that came into my head. Is it the sort of the, the fact that the climbing trans, transports you almost to a different part of your brain? You're in a different place when you're climbing. Has that got something to do with that? Can we overcome our obstacles because of our, of our passion about doing something? Is that, is that what's going on as well, do you think? Proprioception for me. Proprioception. Okay. So the climbing improves your proprioception. Yeah, my because my and my knee's completely injured. Um, I have very, very poor balance at the moment. And because I've had abdominal surgery, my core isn't really feeding yeah. back. Yeah. Um, so I've literally my balance has become a lot worse since the surgery. Yeah. 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 But for me it's absolute yes, there's an element of transportation, of course. Yeah. But it's definitely proprioception. Amazing. Seems like the climbing almost addresses all our needs, doesn't it? The proprioception, the balance, the, the, the muscle tone. Um, it covers all those things. And I guess, you know, keep that ability to keep calm, I guess, because it can be, like you say, it can be quite scary for some people when they're starting out. So you've got to be able to breathe and not get anxious about it. So, yeah. No, I was just curious about the psychology of it as well, whether... Yasmin, you thought that maybe not in an issue case because it's proprioception, but generally when you have that real determination and passion about something, it's amazing what people can achieve, right? You can do. Yeah, I think, I think it's partly that. I think it's partly the reward that comes with climbing. I don't get the same reward from walking that I do from climbing. Yeah. It's not an, yeah. it's not that same, a sense of achievement. It's not that same sense of, um, yeah it's that it's the reward I think it's the fact that climbing is so resilience building as well I think there's a real um factor there that um you know you don't walk to build resilience you walk to function but yes. when you've been climbing for however long you build up this resilience mentally to to setbacks physically to setbacks yeah. and I think knowing that you can apply that is almost like its own safety harness and then there is the physical safety harness that comes yeah. with well, at least not with bouldering but with rope climbing yeah. so um a lot of people with eds find they're more confident um when they're doing roped climbing because they're harnessed in so if they are to fall they just dangle there and rather than sort of hit anything on, on the floor there's no impact yeah. um so i personally um and, and a lot of people I, I talk to with EDS prefer prefer rope climbing. Yeah. There is that physical harness that will catch you as well as your mental harness of all this resilience, the reward, mm -hmm. the outcome that, that you're getting from climbing. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, it's amazing. It's fascinating. Um, so I'm just reading what I've written here. I had so many questions for you. Sorry, I just want to make sure I cover them all. So what advice would you give to our listeners at the moment who may be struggling, you know, because of what a lot of what I see is that people used to be very, very active, you know, they were runners, they were 
you know, you know, former athletes. And then all of a sudden this sort of thing can implode, EDS appears and, and they find themselves going from being very physically active to hardly doing anything at all. Um, what advice would you give to our listeners who might be struggling right now with this concept of how do I get back? You know, I want to be active again. How do I do it? Um, Anusha, do you want to start us off? Well, I've been there. I was a competitive martial artist and competitive swimmer. I went through 10 years of being sedentary and very unwell. And climbing now is building back from those 10 years. And I have periods of being sedentary even then because of not being well. Um, and I've had plenty of setbacks in those years of climbing as well, um, including now. Um, I would say take it little by little. So if you're scared of trying an activity, why don't you go to the venue and watch people trying the activity? Familiarize yourself, ask the questions you might have, just observe for the first time. The second time, observe and interact a little bit. You don't have to get off the ground the first time. You don't have to, if you're climbing, you don't have to do the sport the first time. You can just sit on the cycle if you want to do an indoor cycle class, for instance. Yeah. You don't have to actually pedal. Yeah. It's yeah. about just getting familiar with it and making that sort of stretching your comfort then stretching that and sort of becoming making it safer yeah. it's it's yeah. taking that first step it's not just physical it's massively mental and psychological go back to sport after um especially if you've had to drop out of another sport especially if been it's in, been ingrained into you that you're ill or that you yeah. um shouldn't be doing uh sports it's really hard. So yeah, take take your time, but make those steps. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and Yasmin, what, what would you say? Yeah, so I think um, I'm going to have to follow my own advice um, when I go back because this will be my first time since starting climbing that I will have experienced such a setback. But really, it's just um, expanding on what Anusha said. And this is something I tell my my uh, the children and young people and the parents that I work with as well, yeah. is to celebrate the little wins, to take baby steps and to really have those little wins. Um, and something that can really help is building up, like Anusha said, and having really specific small tasks like, yeah, going to the, the, the place, sitting yeah. and watching until the task is gets there complete a complete a route complete 10 routes and each time you're having these little wins and if you have a setback you go down one and that's okay but yeah. you've still got your list of um we call it a hierarchy or it's often used um for phobias or anxiety we call it an anxiety hierarchy um in psychology it's what i've done actually for my needle phobia um you know break it down into the smallest possible increments and and work it up and i'm gonna have to take my own advice and in fact when I get off this call I'm going to write a hierarchy for getting back to climbing and I think I think that's something that I'll, I'll need to do <laughs> yeah absolutely and you made a good point there you know there are going to be setbacks right it's never a smooth thing and that's okay that you don't have to make that an end to anything you just get back up and try again and I think you know you both said this resilience that the climbing gives you you definitely need resilience, right, when you're working with a chronic illness, because it's not a smooth journey by any means. Yeah, it's very similar to what you're saying, um, to what I say to my clients about finding their baseline. So when they start working out, they might only be able to do one repetition, and that's okay. But if they can do one repetition and not have a massive flare up, we'll go on to two repetitions and then and so on. And as long as you're making that gentle increase rather than the boom and the busting, it's, it works. It really does work. Oh, thank you. Um, so um, Anusha, if we come to you, um, you're an ambassador for EDS UK and Limb Power, And I know you do lots of awareness raising um, in your work. Why are these two organisations so important to you? Um, they're important. So EDS UK in particular, I hold close to my heart because um, I spent a long time believing something was wrong with my body, but not getting to diagnosis. Um, and, and the other part of it was I was noticing the difference in how I was being treated when I said I'd had cancer with the doctors or what I'd had 
uh, my arm, which is a very visible thing and very tangible and therefore easy for them to um, address with OT, physio, or whatever else I would need, versus yeah. trying to explain invisible symptoms of EDS to them. And that because I live with both types of disability, essentially, I felt like I could advocate because I could see the dichotomy and how I was being treated in my workplace in uh, life in general, when you have a physical visible disability, it's much easier to get um, certain types of support uh, because people see the problem. Like if I need a seat on the tube, if I'm wearing full sleeves and a thick jacket, it's very hard to get it. If I roll my sleeves up and go in the tube that day, people get up without me asking. Yeah, That's abnormal. It's not okay. And so that's why I've decided to sort of champion um eds uk in particular because so many people go through this and if i can help with how i speak to my doctors and share the words i use the way mm -hmm. i advocate um the way i explain myself um share my lows and my highs so that people who do feel like it's a bit hopeless and they don't know what to do next about physical activity or yeah. next mm -hmm. steps or share my symptoms Maybe somebody else who doesn't know they have EDS um, yet um, or they're on their way to diagnosis or they've just had it and they have no idea what to do or they're in the middle of a flare and they have no idea how to cope or they're just in a dark place and they just need to know somebody else is in a dark place. Um, you know, um, schadenfreude, misery loves company, right? Sometimes then maybe that that's that's why that's why I do it. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah. And limb power, what do, what do they, what do you do for them? Limb power for me was, was an interesting one. As a child, I didn't, in fact, even as an adult in Luxembourg, I don't know any other upper limb, limb different people here. So I grew up isolated in that sense. Same with cancer. I didn't know anybody my age when I had cancer. In fact, I kept it close to family, friends and family who only knew I was going through treatment. Most of my community over here didn't. Um, so both were very, very isolating experiences. And, and limb power champions sports and arts for people with limb differences and amputees. I'm both passionate about sports and about the arts. When I'm not climbing, I'm crafting or painting or doing something artsy. So, because um, again, it's a mindful exercise I can do when I'm resting. Um, so um, uh, that kind of became a natural choice to champion the kids so that they don't have an isolating experience and they learn to speak up for themselves when they need the support and also that they learn how to advocate for the prosthetics they might need yeah yeah oh very powerful yeah thank you that's that's amazing work and um yasmin you we mentioned in your bio that you um you work with united we climb and all in beta climbing um what what are these organizations and why are they important to you so both organisations pretty much stand for the same thing, and that's the that climbing is and should be for everyone. Um, and that, unfortunately, there are in existence barriers to climbing for certain populations um, that need to be removed. Yes. So this is things like um, discrimination, oppression, exclusion, um, and it could be related to gender, ethnicity, ability, geography, socioeconomic factors, sexuality, all sorts of um, groups that are underrepresented in the sport that I hold so dear. Um, and of course, there's the personal element of it that I am a paraclimber um, and I am a, a plus size climber. And I would say ability wise as well I'm non-athletic or I was at least made to believe that so it's really close to my heart to to promote that actually climbing should be for everyone and that these barriers should be um, minimized and addressed so the difference between the organizations is that all in beta um, is based in the USA mainly and United We Climb is based in the United Kingdom so the concepts are global we, yes. we all we all see these barriers but of course the practical elements like the meetups the support the very specific systemic changes um, they're they're the reason they're sort of two separate organizations yeah. so that the more sure. practical yeah. um, and physical stuff can can take place um, and yeah I I'm 
a member of the team for both. I really just want to get the word out there that climbing should be accessible to all and it is possible if the right considerations and adaptations yeah. um are made yeah yeah amazing yeah very good um so if you had to have one well i'll let you have more than one if you have more than one but what's your um i'll ask you both what's your key inspiring message for our listeners so if there's one thing they can take away from today what should they what should they focus on what should they think about who wants to go first? Go on, Yasmin, you want to go? Go on then. Yeah, I guess, I mean, I guess it's related to what I just said as well. Um, my message would be that we all have some unlearning to do, um, whether that's about the world, about yourself, like I described, I had to unlearn the narrative, uh, whether it's about others, maybe some bias that you might have towards certain groups. We, we all have unlearning. Is that maybe the perception of, of what someone with EDS should look like or should do or someone who's ill should should be doing. Yes. We all have so much that we need to challenge, um, whether that's been instilled from us from childhood or just from the societies, the, the systems that we're part of. So my message would be to, to challenge your beliefs. Um, it's okay to be strong, it's okay to be weak, it's okay to feel lost from your illness it's okay to embrace support but it's also okay to try new things it's okay to have good days bad days challenge the perceptions and the beliefs that you have when when they're coming up and and that way I think we all we all unlearn the negative messages that that so many of us have been exposed to yeah. um, that's my little nugget of wisdom <laughs> no no it's so powerful I think you know these these belief systems that uh, you know we grow up with and, and they become part of who we are if you can smash so many of us have these limiting beliefs and if you can smash through those like you're saying challenge them and it's, it's life-changing isn't it and um because they're so damaging you know people they are. have so much potential and, and they are. it's um yeah it makes me really sad because yeah people trapped by these beliefs and um yeah so i think what I think what I do is to, to challenge them is I just question everything in my head. I don't always question it out loud. Otherwise yes. I might, um, I might sound yeah. like a bit of a, a you know, um, nuisance to people around me, but always, if I have a thought in my head, like you shouldn't be doing that. I go, why? Yeah. I say why to everything. I ask myself why, um, or, you know, that person's being a bit annoying. Why, why do I find them annoying? Um, and it's just always about asking why, whether that's internally, externally, and yeah, yeah. Just challenge, challenging those beliefs. Yeah. Well, that takes real courage and strength, though, doesn't it? Yeah. And it's, and it's not always something I can do. It's not always something I can stop myself before I've had the thought. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's not, it's, it's an art to master. Yeah. It's not something yeah. I'm, I'm perfect at, but it's something that I'd, I'd like to be able to do more and something that I think if everyone did a little bit more of, um, the world would be a bit of a best place. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, thank you, Yasmin. That's really nice. And um, Anusha, what would we? What would yours be? Oh, so my nugget of wisdom would be: you are the only person who can decide what impossible is. Oh, that is. Nice. Um, and I say that as somebody who's been told so many times that things are impossible, either because of my perceived physical ability, my perceived background, uh, my perceived sex. So do you know what? Um, ultimately, you are the one who can put down those boundaries or take, destroy those boundaries. You are the one who makes that decision, what you eat, how you live, how you treat others, how you are treated, but also what you decide to do with your life. Mm. That is very nice. I love that. I'm gonna quote that one on the on the podcast that's very nice brilliant thank you yeah all about empowering isn't it that's come across you're both very very strong people and uh, very inspiring I'm sure um, I mean I've done a little bit of I uh, didn't tell you this I've done a little bit of uh, indoor rock and a bit of outdoor rock climbing actually um, and you've actually inspired me to go and give it another go so because um, I was kind of scared being up there scared of falling you know, but as you said, it's perfectly safe. Nothing happens. Um, so you've inspired me to go and push those boundaries a little bit. 
because I really believe what you were saying about you do feel re when you pull yourself up and you're like, wow, I can feel my muscles and I feel really strong. And, and it, oh, there, there is a lot that's very, very good about it. I can definitely see where that comes from. So oh, thank you, ladies. Now, um, how can people find out more about you um, if they want to get in touch with you or learn more about what you do? So I know have you both got Instagram accounts and um, do you want to share your addresses or if there are any websites or anything you'd like to share that people can find or any events that are coming up? Um, so Yasmin, do you want to share your, your bits? Yeah, so I'm mainly based on Instagram. That's where you can find me. I'm the climb to healthy with dots between each words. Um, if you want to follow the two organisations I've talked about, um, there's United We Climb and All In Beta. That's got underscores, that one between each word. Then yeah. there's an actually uh, Instagram community of EDS climbers, um, which is EDS underscore climbers, set up by a dear friend of of mine and Anoushe's. And um, it's, it's growing. It's lots of climbers who... E either want people who have EDS that think climbing could be for me or climbers that went hang on you have EDS too I have EDS and the community is such an amazing thing it, it's just like you know us bouncing off each other bouncing off this whole Instagram group it's it's okay. amazing it really is and to see each other's achievements climbing is yeah. great so yeah if you want to see a whole community of, of EDS climbers there's there's where you go <laughs> Amazing. Well, I might be joining that one soon then if I get back down to my uh, white spider climbing centre. Ah, yes. <laughs> Good. Thank you. And um, Anusha, how can we get in touch with you or we'll find out about you? Um, yes, I'm on multiple social media channels. So I'm at Anusha Hussain on Instagram and Twitter, though I don't use Twitter that much. At Anusha Hussain one on Facebook. Um, and then you can find me on LinkedIn too, because I do the occasional drop post there. Yeah. And then um, anushehussain.com if you want to check out my website. Oh, great. Um, yeah, as well. um, and then events, um, I normally announce them out on Facebook and Instagram. So just keep an eye out. Um, and if there's stuff that you're interested in, and I share other people's yeah. events as well, if I ever find something that's interested and interesting on topics that I'm interested in yes. um, uh, yeah. as well. And then, yeah, Gift Power Climbing London to follow. We're on Facebook and on Instagram too. Um, so if you're ever in London or if you want to find out about things, because we do things like Spotlight Sundays on different disabilities or neurodivergent people or all sorts. So we sort of try and um, highlight different types of climbers and, and different techniques of climbing, Brilliant. adapting it. Um, so trying to sort of enhance the knowledge of the people and around us and the climbing centres around us. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Well, you both do such amazing work. I mean, honestly, keep doing what you're doing and keep spreading your, your messages because they're so powerful. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you, really, um, really lovely. Thank you so much. Um, so I hope our listeners enjoyed that. Um, um, so um, they both shared their details. So if you, and I'll also put them in the comments below. So if you want to, if you prefer to read, um, I'll put all the Instagram and website details there as well. But thank you so much for everyone for listening. Thank you to our guests for joining us today. Um, and until next time, keep moving. Bye.